So uh, we start off with the question on, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, commercial real estate, usually we don't associate uh, technology with it. So what's your take on, you know, tech in commercial real estate? Yeah. Sure, Pia. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, uh, so if you look at commercial real estate, the way we understand it is uh, hardware, software, and application layer. And in this case, the hardware being the real estate, the office space, and the software being the interiors, which are slightly more fungible. And then you have the huge application layer, which is where you have a plethora of B2B and B2C services that come in. So the technology, if you see, is more overarching, where it typically integrates all the three and allows us to offer a very, very similar, seamless experience. So I think if you look at the large part of commercial real estate in India is driven by IT and the startup sector. And the employee is the hero of the story. So all uh, real estate providers or providers like us are looking at creating a wow experience uh, for the, uh, the employee. And then if you look at how can you be consistent, think about a situation if you have, say, 50 or 100 offices across India. And if you want to ensure that you have proper consistency, standardization in whatever you are offering in those 50, 100 locations, I think you can't do it without technology. So, so technology, all in all, and then obviously doing more with less uh, uh, is where if you look at a lot of sustainability, on-demand solution, personalization, uh, all throughout uh, technology is absolutely critical. And increasingly, uh, post-COVID, of course, the adoption is much better. So that's how we see that technology is very, very integral. Uh, and so has been the case with us from pretty much from the beginning. Okay. So uh, I just come to the COVID-19 pandemic where, where we saw, you know, all of us working from our home and all that. So how did IndyCube, you know, uh, navigate it, uh, this tough time? So COVID-19 for all of us has been a tough time and we were no different. Our industry was obviously in the crossfire. Uh, a narrative got created that uh, do we even require office spaces? I think so from our point of view, what we realize that initially every month was a new month and then every quarter was a new quarter. Uh, so we s decided that we will take things as they come rather than overly getting worried about the long term and all of that. The other conscious decision we took that we will not lay off anyone uh, and uh, we will not leave any properties. We had 55 properties before COVID. We just left one property, small property in Mumbai. We pretty much retained the entire portfolio. And uh, if I look in the hindsight, that was a good decision. Today, the amount of credibility that we have with banks, uh, we have with our landlords, and all is uh, very, very uh, amazing. Third thing was uh, that COVID threw a lot of problems at you. For example, uh, people wanted a almost 50% discount on whatever we were offering as rentals uh, pre-COVID. Or uh, if our model was essentially enterprise where typically we want our clients to commit three years. Clients were coming saying that I want to give only commitment of three months, six months because visibility was very low. So it required a very phenomenal amount of improvisation at our end and look at our uh, business model outside inside uh, to see that how we can do that. And the fourth and the best part that happened out of COVID was the focus on sustainability. Today if you see almost 40 odd buildings we have which are IGBC gold or platinum rated buildings. So that's a very large percentage considering that we are not uh, very dominantly present in tech parks and all that. So I think those were uh, the obvious benefits and then last but not the least, the extra good amount of focus on technology. So net net COVID uh, at one point of time look, looked like an existential crisis, but I think we came out much stronger and uh, we have no regrets and all of you can see the way managed office industry is scaling up. Uh, so all I will say, in a way, thanks to COVID, uh, where we are today. Okay, so uh, what are the three tips, you know, that you would like to give to the entrepreneurs to be resilient in tough times? Like you said, you had navigated that tough time. So what are the tips that you would like to give to the entrepreneurs? So uh, if you look at somebody like me, uh, I am not an entrepreneur the way you see today. I decided to go entrepreneur in 99 uh, when entrepreneurship was a taboo. If you don't get a job, you become an entrepreneur. Today, entrepreneurship is a lot more socially acceptable, fashionable, and all of that. So our mantra is very clear that 
entrepreneurs have a lifetime, the founders have a lifetime, the organizations don't. Uh, so be very clear that whatever you are picking up, you have to pick it up for the long haul. The best companies are bought, they are never sold, uh, typically. And uh, growth at any cost comes as a huge cost. Uh, it comes as a cost of relationships, family, health, uh, uh, you getting uh, to single digit shareholdings. Uh, so be very cognizant about uh, and take appreciate the power of compounding. Uh, the first business that I created continued to run with 3,000 employees, never took any debt, any equity in that business, typically was stable. Uh, so uh, the VC money, if you ask me, or the private equity money is a gold-plated money. Uh, it comes with a lot of responsibility. Uh, so consume it very carefully. And uh, sometimes where a lot of younger entrepreneurs today confuse that uh, if you are a startup, you have to be technology driven, uh, you have to be uh, funded by a VC. I think a uh, lot of stories in India, if you look at a company like Sugana Chicken, Ananda Diyar Bhavan, these are thousands of crores of business uh, built with no venture capital money. So I think there is a, and then other thing, nothing biased to Entrepreneur Magazine or anybody, the English media, the IIT, and then the Western money. These three have hijacked the entrepreneurial story in India. And the entrepreneurial story is much bigger. So have the confidence in yourself and uh, look at the Bharat. Uh, this is where the opportunity is there. And take a long-term view, 15, 20 year view on any entrepreneurship plunge that you decide to take. I think if we do some of this, we'll hold us in very good steam. Yeah. Okay, like you, uh, you mentioned, you know, you started venture long back. So what was the technology played during that time and how it has transitioned over the years, if you can walk us through? So uh, when we started in 99, uh, the recruitment business, uh, when our database uh, had more than 1,000 candidates, uh, we were storing data on spreadsheets. So we realized that we require an application tracking system. So I will say initially it was more about data management and how uh, you can manage yourself better. And from there, we moved on over the next four or five years to automating parts of the workflow, uh, like candidate acquisition or those kind of things. Uh, uh, how do you automate that? From there, it moved to a place where we talk about anytime, anywhere recruiting. Today, if you look in our career net business, if anybody wants to recruit, say, one person in every district of India, and you want all your hiring to be complete by evening in 25 different vernacular languages, how do you do that without having the need to meet the candidate or do in-person assessments and all of that? So I think we have moved to a place where the entire workflow uh, or the service or the product is getting captured on the platform. Uh, now where we are is because a good amount of data capture is there, the focus is on personalization. So my career net kind of things are coming up. So this is how I see the journey uh, uh, of career net on the IndieCube side. We had the advantage that we started the business in 2015, so we knew from the beginning uh, that technology is going to be absolutely critical. So, so I think if you talk about the service delivery, you talk about the, candidate, the employee experience of our clients, uh, or you talk about the multi-tenancy platform, pretty much all of that is there. So I think technology has become absolutely integral, but, but one word of caution with technology is that technology is very expensive to build. Uh, you know what, how salaries have behaved in the last two, three years. Even I don't see massive corrections happening with the slowdown, so to say that is around the corner. So consume it very responsibly again, and uh, focus a lot on adoption uh, rather than building or getting into a feature war. So that has been our uh, mantra so far, and uh, yeah. All right, uh, so the last question that I would uh, like to ask you is like, how do you see sustainability in real estate? So. Sustainability, like everywhere else, is, is very, very important. Uh, if you would have noticed, uh, we have a large number of properties in Bangalore and rest of India. Our properties are not inside the tech parks. So, uh, most of the time, the belief has been that sustainability uh, is, is the realm of five-star tech parks or buildings like UB City and all. I think uh, we took a contra bet and we say sustainability is absolutely doable even in the smallest of the properties. That's the reason you see when I'm talking about 40 plus buildings being IGPC rated and all. So it is not a pipe dream. It can be very cost effectively done. Most of the investments in sustainability have a payoff period of less than two years, typically. And uh, we are doing our bit by putting solar rooftops, uh, water treatment plants, uh, use of a lot of IoT, 
uh, over their uh, typically uh, air conditioning controls and all of that. And I can say with a lot of uh, proud that power consumption, if you see about 40%, we have been able to bring down in the last three, four years. Water consumption on an average is 70 to 80% down because we recycle the entire water. Uh, we use uh, for hand wash uh, water treated, uh, treated rainwater rather than using the groundwater. So uh, absolutely doable. Uh, one other big challenge with sustainability has been that uh, the sustainability investments are done by the landlord community, they are enjoyed by the tenants. Typically, some, that's where we have come up with a model of sustainability as a service, uh, where we are saying that we as a so operator or whatever, we can bring in the capex. So suppose your building requires a 300 to 500 rupees square foot of investment to upgrade stuff to sustainability levels, we will do it. And then over a period of 15, 20 years, over savings in utilities, water and all, we'll recover our monies. Uh, so that model uh, seems to be working well and we are very happy to open source the whole model. Whatever has worked for us, we are saying that if anybody uh, wants to implement in their own buildings, happy to share uh, uh, the data, the process, uh, knowledge, consulting, whatever we can. Uh, typically, yeah. So, so a very good uh, progress on that. And uh, I'm surprised that a lot of our clients have started asking now uh, that what is your net zero plan? Uh, so I will, uh, can say that in the next five years, uh, there will be another big, uh, uh, basically, polarization happening where buildings which have zero carbon footprint or are looking at EV as a means of commuting and all of that, I think those buildings will stand out, that real estate will stand out vis-a-vis -vis other real estate. So uh, very, very good opportunity and happy to share my perspectives with any of you, uh, if you are interested, yeah. So we can say uh, technology is very much uh, necessary for real estate yes. and sustainability also go hand in hand with that.